Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, so this um, talk serves kind of a double purpose um, because uh, at the moment when I was invited here as an invited speaker, I have also contributed an abstract, uh, which also was accepted as, as a talk. But these two talks were supposed to be different. One is more abstract, conceptual, uh, talking about some you know, principles of newly inspired computing, and the other one more concrete about the you know, concrete technical result that I wanted to talk about. So now it's kind of a merge, and I will focus a bit more on the concrete technical result, uh, just because I thought it might be more fun. I was talking about the conceptual stuff enough recently. Um, however, I will start with a very general and conceptual question. Uh, since we are looking for newly, newly inspired computing elements, and many of us are thinking of uh, biological neural networks and trying to understand the brain, I think it's useful once in a while to ask ourselves, so what do brains actually compute? And you can say, no, nah, many things, but um, like we should face the fact that the biological neural systems, they have evolved mainly to generate movement, to move around in the environment. Uh, you know, there's an anecdotic story of a mollusk that you know, has a brain until it attaches itself to a stone, doesn't move anymore, it's its own brain. Um, so that's the story. Now. Of course, you still need the rest of the brain because, in particular, if you want to generate goal-directed movement, so movement that is directed into some object in, out there in an environment, then you do need uh, perception, you do need you know, sensing. Um, perception here is not you know, recognizing anything. Uh, it's about state estimation. You need to estimate the state of an object, you know, its weight, its shape, its position, its pose, in order to extract parameters needed in order to direct movement to this object. You also need constant calibration of your internal and external parameters. So if I want to move my hand to this object, which I see with my eye, I need a lot of calibration to know which movement exactly, like which movement command to send to my arm in order to get there. Right, so there's visual system, there's motor system, there's whole dynamics of my muscles. My muscles can have, you know, can be more tired or less tired. There's a lot of calibration, constant calibration that needs to happen. Um, and I need online adaptation. So if I'm moving to this uh, you know, object and then I maybe discover, oh, it's heavier than I thought, and I need to be able to adjust parameters on the fly. Um, so I need control. So basically, biological neuronal systems are, in the end, intelligent controllers. They are not exactly pattern recognizing machines. They are um, not exactly you know, function approximators. They are there to control, to control the body, to control behavior. Now, what is required to do intelligent control. Uh, and I believe there are two things mainly that are required. The first one is maybe surprising, it's a working memory. Why working memory? Um, as we move around in the environment, the sensory input comes in and goes away. The way how our sensory system is built is that it reacts mainly to transients. Many of you might know the neuromorphic camera, DVS, you know, events. Transient happens, signal is sent. Transient is gone. So in the neuronal system that is supposed to control my body, which has slow dynamics, you need some mechanism to keep the immediate sensory uh, events around for some time. Um, so you need the working memory in order to stabilize neuronal states, whether these are perceptual states or motor states when I control an effector. And the second component, I need some kind of decision making because there are so many things I could attend to, so many you know, different movements I could generate, um, so many features I could extract from the environment, it's just too much. So at every moment when I generate this movement, I need to select them on alternatives, I need some kind of attention not only spatial attention, but also feature-based attention. I need to, you know, to direct my limited resources to what is important currently. Interestingly, these two properties is exactly what today's deep convolutional neural networks don't do. They are feed-forward mappings, input is presented, output is produced. Input is gone, nothing happens. Um, there's no state in this network, so there's no working memory. There's also no decision making. So there's, you know, if certain input is presented, certain output will follow. It cannot select one or the other, you know, depending on whichever you know, internal internal dynamics. Um, so if we imagine that we would have such neuronal c um, control system, um, what do we need in order to make it work? And like the the, the motive of my talk will be that we need a lot of structure. I think it was John who asked this question. Um, how much can we learn from scratch and how much structure might be needed? So uh, my main message is they need a lot of structure in order to have this working memory mechanism, in order to have decision-making mechanism, in order to be able to control um, you know, some, some body that can generate movement in an environment. And you also need very good interfaces 
two sensors and motors in order to you know, sense the world around you and in order to uh, move a factor. And, and these, you know, these interfaces are very often the bottleneck even for, for our neuromorphic systems, for most of them. Okay, so now I will focus on one particular example where we try to realize these principles. And the example will be neuromorphic SLAM. Those of you who has anything to do with robotics, they know that SLAM is simultaneous localization and mapping. A fundamental problem for any robot that is moving in an environment, uh, you know, some vehicle, like you know, little vacuum cleaner that some people have at home. Uh, this vehicle, if it's in an unknown environment, it needs to build a representation of environment, knowing where things are and localize itself in this environment. And it needs to do it at the same time and there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem when you try to solve it. Um, so, uh, let's see, a little overview of the components that are part of our neuromorphic SLAM. So the first thing that we will do is estimate the orientation, right? The simplest thing, 1D orientation in the environment, estimate it based on a sensory signal that I can you know, sense on the robot, and that's usually velocity. So I can know with which velocity I'm moving. Like in, uh, in biological system, we have vestibular system for that. On the robot, we have IMU that can measure your current velocity. So we need some, some little architecture that, based on this angular velocity, will estimate our head direction. If we had that, have that, we can, using our translational velocity, again, a sensor that is easily there, you know, even ants count their steps and can estimate their translational velocity. You can use, again, vestibular system. On the robot, there's also IMU there or wheel encoder sensors that allow you to estimate translational velocity. Using this translational velocity and your estimation of heading direction, we can estimate position in an environment. Now, if we have estimation of the position, and we have some other sensor that allows us to sense some things in the environment. And here, you, know, you could use your, your favorite object recognition system, you could use some bumper or laser range finder that detects some interesting stuff. And now we can start forming a memory or forming a map. We know where we are, we see something interesting, we can put it in the map. Next time we will know where we have met it. So these are the components just to structure the rest of it. So we're talking about neuromorphic SLAM. So what I will present was implemented on three, these three devices. The first two, Rolls and Dynap, Giacomo was talking about them. So these are the devices developed at INI. They use mixed signal, uh, analog digital circuitry. The neurons and the synapses are implemented with subthreshold analog transistors, noisy, mismatch, uh, very sensitive to temperature, can be used as a nice thermometer, as Kmobena mentioned. Uh, pretty small scale devices. This one has 256 neurons, not 1,000 neurons, just neurons. And, and this guy has 4,000 neurons. This one has on-chip learning plasticity. I'll talk about it a little bit, and this one doesn't. And the third device, uh, Loihi from Intel, uh, offers us more resources, more neurons. We have 100 to 200,000 neurons there. We have quite some flexibility in terms of learning rules that we can use there. Um, it may be less energy efficient than these guys, um, but it allows us to you know, prototype larger scale architectures and put some components together. Um, so let me zoom in on the first of these devices, the rolls. A little scheme, just so that you can imagine what we are dealing with in terms of hardware here. So in this scheme, these triangles are the neurons. I have 256 of these neurons. I have two sets of synapses, one set of all-to-all non-plastic synapses, which I can configure, I can program, with quite some restrictions. Um, so uh, Jacob maybe didn't mention that, but uh, for these synapses, I can select uh, one of four different values for the whole chip that these synapses can take. Uh, each value I can fine tune, it's an analog value, right? So I can tune it to, to any value I want, but there are only four different ones that I can use. So quite some restrictions. It's not um, like a lot of representation of power that I have here. And I have a set of all-to-all -all plastic synapses that implement some spike time dependent plasticity like learning rule. So if two neurons are active at the same time, there will be some STDP like mechanism potentiating the synapses if I allow them to. So I decide which synapses I want to change and which I want to not change. So I can, it's also part of construction of my architecture. So analog circuits for neurons and synapses, noisy mismatch and so on, digital communication of spikes. Uh, programming this device um, amounts to wiring up you know, deciding which synapses should be there and setting parameters of neurons and synapses. In a way, it's also like creating a little controller for this physical system with all this mixture of analog and digital circuits. Okay, so now going to the architecture. Head in direction is the first thing we care about. Uh, many of you might know this model for representing head in direction with the um, bumper tractor. So imagine we have population of neurons here represented by circles, and each neuron represents different heading directions. So usually you imagine it as a, as a little ring of neurons. Um, when one of these neurons is active, it means currently I'm facing 10 degrees 
no, or north, and then as they move, then different neurons will be active. Um, it's an important de design decision. So the representation that we have here is something that people call space code or place code. It's not a rate code because how uh, the exact firing rate of this neuron doesn't matter. It just matters that this neuron fires most, more than all the others. Um, then, then my estimation of the position will you know, have certain value. It's, it's also not time code, obviously, and it's not a rate code, it's the place code. Now, in order to stabilize this place code, we connect neurons in this population in a particular way, so-called winner-take-all, soft winner-take-all, so we have positive connection to the neighbors and then inhibitory connection to everyone else. What does it buy? It buys a certain stability because these neurons, they are arranged here according to the orientation and the neighboring neurons, they encode similar orientations. So they, um, you know, kind of, um, no, should be connected because of the noise in my sensory surface. If, if this neuron is active, it may be uh, also that my orientation is you know, slightly to the left and slightly to the right. Um, so this type of connectivity is known as soft winner take all. What it leads to is that activation pattern will be some kind of a bump. So it's not like one neuron will be active, will be a little population of neurons will be active and will represent the orientation. Uh, it's called population code because a few neurons will represent the value, not their rate, not their precise um, timing of spikes. There's another name for the same structure called dynamic neural fields. And, and usually I will have like half of the talk about that, here I won't. Um, but basically you can describe the same dynamics with these continuous in time and in space differential equation. It's an attractor equation, right? This you have u dot, this activation function, you have minus u, meaning the, the, all the other terms define an attractor. This integral term is the connectivity, right? Is this uh, interaction. W is interaction kernel, Mexican head, local excitation, global inhibition. Uh, F is some sigmoidal nonlinearity that separates spiking, non-spiking. So this is just a different way to, uh, you know, to write down the system as a differential equation, which you can then simulate on the computer numerically uh, or, or not. If you have a neuromorphic hardware, then you don't need to simulate it numerically. You just connect, can connect a network to implement it. And there's a lot of analysis uh, that has been done um, with the systems and they have some nice properties. So the first property that they have is that if I have this activity peak, then this will be a stable state of these dynamics. It will be a point attractor in these dynamics. Meaning if I have some conflicting inputs, then they won't interfere with my state. And the second property that I get is because of this global inhibition, I have this selection instability. If I have two inputs that you know, conflict, that tell me uh, I'm now either here or there, then because of the global inhibition, I will select one of them. So I will make this decision for one of them and not for the other. So you can already see we have in this elementary computing unit, we have some properties that we wanted to have in the beginning. We have some notion of working memory, meaning some stabilization of our states, and we have some capability to select among alternatives and to make decisions. Okay, head interaction network. Now we have this activity bump. Now we want it to move based on the velocity of our animal. How do we make it move? Well, we could make connections in our network asymmetrical, right? If you make them slightly asymmetrical, the bump will move. But you know, we want to be flexible there. We might want to move it to the right and we might want to move it to the left, maybe also with different speeds. So it's not so convenient to just play with connections there. Um, what we can do instead is introduce another <laughs> layers of neurons shift neurons. So we would have some neural populations that uh, encode the speed of the animal and they will be driven by sensory input. So it would be angular velocity clockwise, angular velocity counterclockwise. We have some IMU, very costly, let's say we just detect we are moving clockwise or counterclockwise. Then we have uh, two populations of neurons that represent combinations of our current head interaction and the speed clockwise or counterclockwise. So if one neuron is active here, let's say this one, it means that I'm currently here and I am moving clockwise. So what I can do then is that I can have uh, an, another neural population that sums uh, all activity from all these layers. I could have more, I have more speeds, I could have more of these layers. So this guy will just sum them all up. Uh, there will be connections that are shifted. So if I'm here and they're moving clockwise, then I will activate the neuron that's in clockwise direction. Um, and like this layer will activate in the other direction and they will feed back to my original layer and will create this movement, <coughs> this wave. Just a little architecture to make the movement. Now a problem, like remember, we are trying to implement this uh, architecture in this analog device with mismatch, variability, low precision and so on. Um, in this case, 
this architecture where I want this neuron to be active if it receives two inputs, but I want all these other neurons around it that receive only one of the inputs to not be active. And this is something which is hard to tune with spiky neurons. I want two inputs to converge in the neuron uh, and then it fires. I want one neuron to be there and it never fires because otherwise, you know, the system um, you know, gets confused. Now, remember, I have mismatch, 20% variability between the uh, you know, resting level of the neurons if I set the parameters exactly the same. I have limitation on the um, synapses that I can use. Um, so with this structure, it just won't work robustly enough. So we have found another structure that works more robustly and that uses pervasive inhibition. So our active head interaction neuron will inhibit most of the shift network, but for the neurons that correspond to, to this position. All the others will be inhibited, only the ones that correspond to my current head interaction won't be inhibited and have a chance to be active if the correct speed neuron will be active. So we have found this as the building block that we use in many places that allows us to have more robust representation um, of things where we want to, to inputs to converge and to cause activation. And if you think about the brain, in the basal ganglia circuits and in many other circuits, you have this pervasive inhibition, local inhibition, and the mechanism of disinhibition. If you want something to be active, you disinhibit it instead of activating it. Okay, so what does our head interaction network do? Like first, it's, you know, it's inspired by some circuits found in, in mice and in, even in flies. Um, we take this, this network, you know, which we design on paper, basically. We translate it into connectivity metrics. So this would be uh, the synapses between 256 neurons on our Rolls chip. Uh, red ones are positive synapses, blue ones are negative synapses, different shades are different values. So you see quite sparse, so most of the neurons, many of the neurons are not connected. You can see some winner take all connectivity. Um, you, know, you can see one population is connected to the other. So basically all this connectivity translate to this connectivity matrix. We can put it on a chip, we can connect it to the robot, and we can show how this system can, can work and can track orientation of the robot in real time. Um, this is how it looks like. So these are spikes recorded from the Rolls chip. Um, these are 256 neurons. Different colors correspond to different populations. The interesting one is this head direction population. So just these, I don't know, maybe 50 neurons, the black ones. And you can see as the robot moves, and you'll see it moving in a second, uh, you know, the, the, this population of neurons track its orientation. What you can see here um, is that at some point we check, is the orientation represented on a chip the, the one that the robot really has? Uh, and usually it's not, because we accumulate error. As we integrate the velocity, we accumulate error, right? So here, we think our head interaction is here, but it's actually over there. So we need to introduce some mechanisms to correct this error. And we can do it using some other modality. We use IMU to do path integration. We can use, for instance, vision. If we have some salient feature somewhere in the environment, we can use it when we return to this feature to extract the correct orientation and to correct our estimation of, of orientation. So we can do reset. And then if we do it, then you know, there's no error accumulated. So many things happening here. So one, we do some kind of sensor fusion, right? We have one sensor, um, IMU, we have a proprioception, we have another sensor, visual sensor, we have a way to fuse them using winner take all dynamics. So we can only fuse them because this reset input is strong enough to kill the representation uh, from, from the IMU to, to inhibit the peak there. Okay, so now the little video that shows that it's real work. So that's the robot from the top turning around, and these are spikes in real time coming from, you know, from all these analog neurons on the chip tracking the position. You see it's noisy, you see sometimes the activation is lost, but then it's, you know, it catch, catches up. You see, oops, it's now gone. Um, so despite of you know, using these analog circuits, we can really use them and we can feed in real time um, sensor measurements from the robot and represent, represent the orientation on the, on the chip. Now that's of course not the end of the story. Uh, because this moment when I have made a turn and I have discovered there's some discrepancy about my estimation of my state and the real state, um, I have an error. And indeed, like we should ask ourselves, how fast should the activity bump move? How shall my neuronal system know how fast this bump should move on the attractor network? It's very easy to create this attractor bump moving, but how do I align it with actual physical movement? Um, a lot needs to happen there, but what we need to do, we need to estimate the error at least the direction of error. Was I moving too fast or was I moving too slowly? Uh, and I need to, uh, to, in order to do that, I need to compute the difference. Now remember, my values were represented with the activity bumps in neural populations. 
So how do I compute difference if my values are represented with a neuronal population? It's like A minus B, but how do I do it with neuronal populations? Um, so there happens to be an architecture, a little circuit, which is almost you know, magical because you can do uh, many operations with it, but in particular you can do this minus operation. So how does it work? So this would be the neural populations. Now they are now like continuous lines, but imagine this is a neural population with a little bump, activity bump. Here it says target position, but you no, know, whichever our A is, I want to compute A minus B. So this would be a representation of my A value, no, here, and this would be a representation of my B value. Between them, I have a two-dimensional array of nodes, of neurons, which receive input along the two axes from my one-dimensional inputs. You see these ridges. So a bump will create a ridge in this two-dimensional space. And where the two ridges cross, I will have so super threshold activity. So these neurons, they represent combinations of my you know, A and my B, the two things I want to subtract from each other. Now, if I now project from this 2D population onto third 1D population along the diagonal. So basically I sum the output of this network along diagonals, along the larger diagonal and smaller diagonals. What I get is you can look at it different ways. And one way to look at it would be a convolution of this array uh, and the other array, like just the convolution. And this convolution amounts to this position being position of one of them minus position of the other one. So I have a little circuit that I can you know, configure wire up, and here I will always get one position minus the other. If it's on this side of, you know, of the midline, that's positive difference, here would be the negative difference. Five minutes, it's fine, almost done. So basically what we can do, we can use this principle to estimate the error. Uh, let me lead you through, through this convoluted image here. Um, so first, this is our head interaction network. It's drawn slightly differently, but here would be my head, estimated head interaction. Here is my reset with visual input. I have the true orientation. Now the two are fed into this two-dimensional area of error detection neurons. Uh, so one, the estimated along one of the axes, the other one, the true along the other axis. Uh, some neurons will be active that represent the combination. I read out along the diagonal and either get a positive error or a negative error. So I have estimated my error. Now I can do something uh, about this error and there. I won't go into detail, you could do different things, but here somehow we can change my uh, shifting dynamics to go faster or slower in one direction or in the other. Um, and again, we have implemented it uh, in hardware, this time in Loihi hardware, uh, because that network, uh, the two-dimensional network, right, required a few more neurons more than we had uh, on our devices. Um, so what you can see, if we have some estimation of the true orientation, then uh, no, we get either we can integrate faster or we can integrate slower. So we can have this online correction as soon as we have estimation of the error. Okay, let's move on now much more quickly. So if we have estimation of our heading direction, we can do the same story in 2D for position estimation. We can have uh, some you know, sheet of neurons representing position in the environment. We can have several sheets of shifting layers that will shift the activity bump in different directions, something what people think the grid cell, uh, cells are probably doing in, in rodents. Um, and again, we have, will have these integrated position neurons that shift around the position neurons. So we will have a bump moving in a 2D population of neurons representing the position of the animal. Then we have some other neural population that represents whichever features we want to represent. In a simple case, we have a robot with a bumper. It can detect walls. So our feature neuron will be only one and will be wall. We connect it with plastic synapses to our estimation, position estimation neurons. And in these plastic synapses, we will learn a map of an environment. So the map will be the potentiated synapses represent the positions of wall. Um, again, we have implemented the system in, uh, both in Rolls and, and on Loihi. Um, so here is you know, the setup. Little robot with a bumper in this little environment bumping into walls. There's a little additional obstacle in the middle. Um, you know, this representation of the network on the Rolls chip. won't go into detail here. We'll just try to explain how the results look like. Um, so these are the you know, 100 neurons on the Rolls chip. These colorful neurons are the position neurons. Right? It's very coarse, it's 10 times 10 is our position, position representation. Um, so as the robot is moving around, the different position neurons are active. Once in a while it bumps into a wall and then the wall neurons are active. Each time the two are active, there will be a plastic synapse potentiated between them. 
now we have learned our map in plastic synapses, but how do we read it out? Um, no, so that's a little problem also in neuromorphy hardware. You have plastic synapses, but how do you look at them? Uh, not quite trivial. If you have large architecture, maybe not a problem. They will just do something. You don't need to look at them. But here, to look at these neurons, we just activate uh, our position neurons one by one and see which of the uh, wall neurons will be active, because now the synapse is potentiated. Uh, and by doing that, we can decode our collisions. And we can see, it's you now learned something reasonable. Here, the colorful lines are the true position of the robot as it moves in the environment. The blue line is the estimated position on the neuron, 10 times 10, so very coarse. And the stars are the collisions. So in all the collisions that happened, they are represented as coarsely as it could be. So what we have shown is that we can learn maps of different environments, not to complex environments, but still. And, oops, let me move back for a second. And importantly, we can also learn maps of uh, uh, dynamic environments, if environment is changing. What does it entail? If environment is changing, I come to some place, there used to be a wall there, there's no wall now. I need to be able to unlearn the synapse. Uh, that tells me there was a wall there. And this is untrivial because remember, I'll need two more minutes. <laughs> because remember, we have learned the connection, meaning that if I come to this place and I, there used to be a wall there, uh, there will be a plastic synapse here. I will expect the wall to be there. This neuron will be active. Um, but luckily it will be slightly less active than if I would actually experience a wall being there. So there's a chance that I can unlearn a learned connection. Um, however, this chance depends on the learning rule that I have on the chip. And luckily, uh, on the chip, I don't have a pure STDP. So STDP has potentiation and depression. Potentiation if the timing of spikes has correct order, pre and post. Depression if the timing of spikes has reverse order. Timing of spikes has nothing to do with me coming to a place where there used to be a wall and now there's no wall. The, there will be spikes here and spikes there. So I cannot just use STDP. I need to use more like a Hebbian-like learning rule. Um, so luckily in the learning rule that Giacomo has explained in detail in his talk, we have this component that if the postsynaptic neuron has a lower firing rate, there will be a larger probability of depression than if the postsynaptic neuron has high firing rate. So we just use that. If I come to a place there used to be a wall there, the postsynaptic neuron is firing because I'm expecting a wall, but uh, with lower frequency than if it experiences a wall and my synapse will depress. So what this plot is showing in a, a bit obscure way, um, that on a robot with uh, synapses on the Rolls chip, so with really with the physical implementation, we can uh, learn collisions and we can forget them. Um, so here, you know, these are the collisions, and I, I, can, I can talk in more detail, the collisions that have been learned, you know, just a few, and here the collisions um, which the robot you know, revisited the place, the wall is not there anymore, we are forgotten. Good, so this is Basically concluding, so, so I have shown you one, one example, right? localization and mapping. It's quite fundamental computation here because we have a state estimation. It can be used for navigation. It can be also used for estimating the properties of an object if I want to direct my action on it and building representation. We have also other examples that show uh, how attractors in a sensory motor loop can generate behavior, navigation behavior, obstacle avoidance, and target acquisition. We can show how we can do reference frame transformation using this uh, little network that does you know, the minus operation. And we can also show how we can do adaptive motor control, again, estimating the errors and trying to correct them. Um, so the take-home messages are the following. First, lots of structure is needed to control behavior with neurons. Uh, all these you know, uh, structures that we have seen, if you want to represent state with neuronal populations using place code, or if you want to stabilize the states and decisions um, with recurring connections, um, we've discovered that we need the, the disinhibition for, you know, to have robust computation, or um, that we want to have adapting couplings between sense quantities and states, we want to do error estimation and correction. We cannot hope that all these properties will just emerge from you know, end to end learning with a bag of neurons. So you just start with no structure and you just hope that all these will emerge. It probably won't. Biology uh, needed a lot of evolutionary time scale in order to get there. So why not use that? Um, something that um, has already been found by, by biology. If you have the structure, then learning can be very simple. It can be one shot, you know, just update of connection. I, I, have, I sensed a wall here. Uh, I found certain feature in a certain location. I just, just learned that. Um, and we, the weights can basically be binary because of this place code that we use. Weight is either there or not. So either these two values are connected or not. So it all can be very simple. Um, 
And finally, so object representation and object learning can be more of a map formation problem and not just pattern recognition. So really, this SLAM is some fundamental mechanism that can be used all over. And thank you very much for your attention. If there are some questions, I'll be happy to answer. So I guess uh, a question, a question, you're, you're, you're closest. So um, you're, it's a very neat method for SLAM, and I'm wondering if you've analyzed it, how it scales with sort of larger environments, more features, and so forth, um, in particular compared to something like Rat Slam, which is a more, it's not a spiking model, it's not, but it is loosely hippocampus based. So have you thought about kind of complexity scaling in this? Yeah. So this is literally a Rat Slam in spikes. Rat Slam is very similar. So we had you no know, few additional components because we are on this you know, analog hardware. We have thought about some things that they didn't think of. We are trying to build this long-term uh, memory. Also in neurons, they didn't have it in neurons. They just had matrices. Uh, there, but otherwise it is the Red Slam. That's what gives us a hope that it will scale, right? Because Red Slam is one of the neuronally inspired approaches that they have shown works in large environments. Um, how large the environment can be depends on how many neurons we will have to, to represent it. Thank okay, thank you very much. Let's thank Yulio again. And, uh,